Shrikuna, the director sir has joined. I, uh, where, here? Uh, I can't can see. You? I can't see. Maybe you can call him once. Uh, yes, yes. Should I, yeah. Can you just call? Uh, I can call uh, Rakesh. Huh? Ah, yes. Jimson, data sir would be joining in two minutes. Rakesh told. Sir, we will wait for two minutes. Is that okay, sir? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, but we have the audience, so you may want to uh, let them know also. Yes, yes. Uh, dear participants, uh, we are just waiting for our director sir to join. So we are actually uh, reaching the limits of 100 actually. So we are also streaming uh, in YouTube. Uh, Sandosh, can you share that link in the chat window? Ah, yes. In case somebody uh, signs out, we have to remove someone. Otherwise, that sir cannot join now. Ah, yes, yes. So uh, don't admit anymore. Uh, yeah, YouTube link has shared. So we uh, please exclude two people. Don't admit. Is it not possible to uh, extend the 100 limit? OK, OK. Sir, we have uh, only 100 in this. Well, I'm sure you can extend it, right? Meaning if you said a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah I will do that. Santosh, are we extending the numbers? I'm trying, sir. Okay. 
otherwise exclude some participants uh, for example rajan singh or somebody no no i will i will i'll manage ha ah, okay if you see direct rate or tn singh please hello uh, Jinson, uh, I think director sir is online because I can see one T N Singh in the participants. Okay, sir, are you there? director sir can you hear us yes i can hear you please go ahead oh okay sir thank you very much we are starting now yes yes please go ahead yeah so uh, sangamitra you can start yes sir okay thank you um a very good afternoon to everyone present in this forum today I, Sangamitra Mishra, on behalf of the organizing committee, take this opportunity to welcome you all to the seventh IEEE International Conference on Data Science and Engineering. This conference provides a forum for leading experts from the data science embedded systems programming and high performance compute computing community to present their latest research, exchange ideas, and conduct brainstorming applications. This conference is jointly organized by IIT Patna, Queen's University UK, and Cochin University Kerala. Data science today uh, is considered an art rather than science, and as researchers, we continuously try hard to look out for effective coordination between art and science to demonstrate a more robust model in the real world. ICDSC 2021 aims to provide an opportunity for researchers. to come together to share their work and learn and at the same time take back ideas and vision to work for a globally competitive environment to start the program uh, i request uh, everyone to please pay your kind attention in honor of our institute sir shiparna परम 
Thank you all. I request Dr. Jimson Matthew from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering and Program Chair of ICDSC 2021 to speak a few words and welcome the audience. Thank you, Sankamitra. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. A very good afternoon to uh, one and all, Honorable BOG Chairman, Chief Guest of the Day, Dr. Anand Deshpante, Honorable Director, IIT Patna, Patron of the Event, Professor T.N. Singh, Conference General Chair, Professor Santosh Kumar, CAC Head, Dr. Sriparna Saha, and Organizing Chairs, Arjit Mandal, Dr. Samrat, Dr. Samna Tripathi, and Dr. Deepak, and dear participants. Welcome to the seventh International Conference on Data Science and Engineering. ICDSC started in 2012. The conference aim is to inspire and educate data scientists in the field. This year, the conference is jointly organized by IIT Patna, Queen's University, UK, and Cochin University. Highlight of this year's conference is that we have five very important uh, keynote talks and two from industry and three from academia. We have 11 technical papers. IIT Patna is always committed, not only teaching and research, but also organizing other events like this to promote research activities. In any conference, it has been uh, it's a pleasure to be with enthusiastic researchers, but uh, due to this pandemic, we have to do this program in virtual mode. We are pleased to see a very high participation. We are also streaming uh, this uh, event uh, over uh, YouTube. <clears throat> uh, with this short background, I am uh, coming to this straight to my responsibility. First and foremost, I would like to welcome Honorable Chairman uh, to this conference. In a very short notice, I have requested Chairman to inaugurate this event. Uh, with no hesitation, he has accepted and Chairman also agreed for, to deliver an inaugural keynote on how do I become a better data scientist? 10 things I must do to be a better data scientist. And many people uh, commented out that it's a very good title and very apt for the uh, conference. Thank you, sir. On behalf of uh, ICDSC, TPC, and all the organizing team, I would like to extend my warm welcome to the chairman. In spite of all his busy schedule, our director, sir, has agreed to, uh, to come for this inaugural ceremony. Director, sir, is our patron of the event, and he is, uh, is presiding over the function. He has always been with us to support all the activities. Although he is traveling at the moment, he has uh, kindly agreed to join uh, this uh, short time uh, for this inaugural ceremony. Thank you very much, sir, for this uh, your time and your blessings. It is a pleasure to uh, <coughs> welcome uh, Dr. Sriparna Saha, CAC head. She has always been with us for all the support. Last but not the least, I would like to uh, welcome the organizing team, Dr. Santosh Kumar, Dr. Deepak, and some, Dr. Samrat, and Dr. Arjit Bantal, and so, Dr. Somnath. Without their support, this conference would not have been possible. This is the second time we are organizing this event. 2019, we organized this event uh, with a great success uh, with the physical mode in physical mode. So we initially planned for physical mode, but due to the pandemic, we are going in virtual mode. Thanks also to all the student volunteers and others who contributed to this event. I'm sure this important keynotes talks and technical sessions would provide a serious online platform for the authors to interact with experts. And once again, I welcome all, all of you to this conference. Jai Hind. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. Um, I now request Dr. Uh, Shripanna Saha, uh, head of the Department of Computer Science, to enlighten the audience regarding the department. 
ma'am please yeah so i hope i am audible sangeetra yes ma'am you are audible yeah okay so honorable dr adan dishpande the bug chairman iit patna honorable professor tn singh director iit patna and the tpc team and the organizing team of this conference dr santosh dr jimson dr jeep sabrat mandal dr arijit mandal dr samanath tripathi and dr deepak so uh, on uh, at, at first on behalf of department of computer science and engineering i welcome all the guests and the participants in this seventh international conference on data science and engineering organized by iit patna so you know data is the new oil for designing any automated systems so artificial intelligence machine learning techniques and recently developed deep learning based techniques are hugely dependent on data so data engineering basically involves data collection methods designing enterprise data storage and retrieval the core data science subjects focus on data analytics visualizations predictive modeling and analytics of this data driven decision making so given this particular theme the conference is very timely i i and i must congratulate the tpc team and the organizers for organizing this in iit patna so let me as the head of the department let me introduce briefly the department before you so the department of computer science and engineering has started its journey in 2008 currently there are 13 faculty members and around 505 number of students including btech mtech ms and phd students in our department so our faculty members are working in cutting as research areas in the field of ai artificial intelligence machine learning natural language processing network security privacy blockchain technology iot fault tolerant computing complex and social networks cyber physical systems image processing computer vision distributed and mobile computing algorithms and many more so there are many sophisticated research labs in our department including lcvr center for excellence of natural language processing Sustrut so EZDI Research Lab on Health Informatics, Network Security Lab, Advanced Computing Lab, Embedded Systems Lab, Programming Languages and Robotics Lab, etc. We are offering two BTEC programs: one in Computer Science and another is in AI and ES, Artificial Intelligence and Data Science. This program we started from this year only. We also offer MTEC in Computer Science and PhD in Computer Science. We also help Department of Mathematics for running their MTech in Mathematics and Computing course. And uh, in from this from the next uh, academic year onwards, we are also planning to start a minor program in CS for BTech non-CS students and executive MTech in AI in FinTech in near future. So Department of Computer Science and Engineering has also launched a two-semester postgraduate certification program jointly with Bombay Stock Exchange on data analytics and business intelligence. we also established a collaboration with willy and we are going to offer some pg certification courses in the areas of blockchain big data engineering ai and ml engineering cyber security etc with tcs ion we also offer some certification courses in the field of in the field of deep learning and natural and neural networks and big data on cloud so our faculty members are involved in several government and industry sponsored projects currently 51 such projects are running in the department or rupees 2037.08 lakhs and our funding agencies are dst sar meti ministry of home affairs and different industries like krisil accenture lcbr wipro uh, so please uh, start recording the chairman is asking yeah so some notable projects uh, are basically ai based tools for women and child safety that we are doing with the help of ministry of home affairs Hindi to English machine aided translation in judicial domain, then AI driven intelligent tool for personalized risk stratification and early detection of stroke, then AI enabled dashboard to track key performance indicators of state plan of action for children of Bihar, autonomous goal oriented and knowledge driven neural conversational agent, multimodal recommendation systems, development of lizard like robotic uh, spy survival systems etc. our faculty members are also getting several recognitions our students are also getting several best paper awards in different conferences and faculty members are also in the associate editor of several international conference journals like itpl asian transactions expert systems with applications plus one and many more and two faculty members are also listed in the top 2% list of scientists published by stanford university we regularly organize several conferences and workshops and gyan workshops in our department and we are publishing in top tier journals and conferences 
So I hope participants will learn the cutting edge technologies related to data science by attending this conference. I wish all the very best to all the participants. And I also wish the conference a grand success. So Jai Hind. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I now request our honorable director, sir, of uh, IIT Patna, Dr. Trilok Nath Singh, to kindly deliver the presidential speech. Hello. Yes, sir. We are audible. Hello. You are audible. Okay. okay. Honorable Chairman Governing Council, Dr. Anand Despande, Jimson Mathu, organizer of this conference, Head Department of Computer Science, Dr. Saha, other faculty members, participants, I am indeed happy to know that this department is organizing a multi-disciplinary uh, conference based on the data science and the technology. Uh, in association with these two other eminent uh, and important universities, data science is definitely now has taken the, you can say the driving seat in all work of the science and the technology. And mostly, if you can see the safety of the data, security of the data, and transforming the data from one end to other, it is equally important. I think the department is working very hard on this area. They have the expertise in this area. And I wish that this conference will bring a, some notable change in the mindset of the people and the how to work where to work, and how to resolve these outstanding issues related to this science and this technology. I wish all of you a great success. And once again, I'm thankful to our honorable BOG chairman for sparing his valuable time in spite of his busy schedule to participate and uh, give his thoughts because he is the man uh, who can take a lot of data science related research and the new idea and by which we all will be get benefited. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It is an absolute honor to have amongst us Dr. Anand Desh Pandey, Chairman and Managing Director at Persistence Systems. He is also the chairman of the Board of Governors at IIT Patna. Uh, I request Dr. Arijit Mandel, Assistant Professor with the Department of Computer Science, IIT Patna, and the Organizing Committee member of ICDSC 2021 to take over this forum and introduce our chief guest. Sir, please. Thank you, Shangamitra. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, warm welcome to all the participants. So it's always a pleasure to introduce the chief guest question. So Dr. Anand Deshpande is the founder, chairman, and managing director of Persistent System since its inception and is responsible for the overall leadership strategy and management of the company. He is also the chairman of BOG of IIT Patna. Dr. Deshpande holds a BTEC degree in computer science from IIT Kharagpur and MS and PhD also in uh, computer science from Indiana University, Indiana, USA. As a true technology visionary, Dr. Despande's strength lies in identifying and investing in next generation technologies and encouraging internal entrepreneurship to ensure that persistent systems stays at the forefront of technology innovation. Dr. Despande has been the driving force in growing persistent systems from its inception in 1990 to the publicly traded global company of today. He has been recognized by his alma mater, IIT Kharagpur, as a distinguished alumnus in 2012 and by the School of Informatics of Indiana University with the Career Achievement Award in 2007. Prior 
to founding persistent system dr despande began his professional career at hp laboratories in palo alto <coughs> Yes, sir. Just we can continue. Uh, so, uh, actually, my system got hanged for a while. So just uh -huh. so, so okay. So uh, <coughs> Paulo Alto, California, where he worked as a member of technical staff from May nineteen eighty nine to October nineteen ninety. Anand Despande served <coughs> uh, in uh, many uh, non uh, or many non profitable organization as well as professional organization head. one of them is including uh, acm where he served the first president and 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 he 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 along with his family members he has started one uh, non profit organization dear uh, sri so which basically not just the young startup and entrepreneur ships through this uh, organization which is uh, uh, building uh, gradually uh, uh, promoting lot of uh, young enthusiast mind people so we Okay. Uh, I will do Dr. Despande. So, over to you, sir. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, just to make one announcement. So, we have reached the hundred okay. limit. We are not able to change it, but it is streamed over the YouTube, and the link is in the chat window. If your friends are facing problem, please inform. It is available uh, through YouTube. Thank you very much, sir. You can continue. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the seventh IC DSC 2021 being held in IIT Patna. I'm really delighted uh, that the organizers uh, have invited me for this session, and it's a pleasure to be part of an IIT Patna event. Uh, when I was thinking through what I should be talking about today, uh, I figured that since there are many students who are attending this conference. maybe better for me to focus on uh, some ideas as to is to what kind of things should students do now so that they can be a uh, good professional data scientists so that is really what i'm going to be talking about and uh, i thought uh, that might be meaningful for all of you let me just uh, see if i can make it a full screen thing Just one second. Oops. Is it there? Can you see my screen? Yes, yeah, sir. It is for kind of full okay. screen. Perfect. Yeah. So now it's full screen, I think. So okay. So as was mentioned already, there was a lot of introduction done, but I just want to mention a few things here. Uh, one is that um, you know I'm the chairman at Persistent, and we are hiring people here. So I, this is some of the stuff that I'm going to share with you are things that we expect when we hire data scientists. Uh, the other thing i wanted to mention was that um, you know i'm a big believer in the acm and i would like to encourage all of you to become members of the acm uh, in uh, due course of time or whenever we have a very attractive student membership opportunity as well so please um, become a member of the acm um, so what am i going to talk about and this is just a, i found a nice cartoon so i thought i'd use this to tell you what i'm going to talk about so this is clearly everybody wants to become a data scientist but what should you do to become a data scientist and that's really where i'm going to focus my attention today uh i want to share a, a an overall architecture of how people should plan their careers and uh, this is basically what what is known as the pie architecture and the idea here in the pie architecture is that the square box that i have around it is the overall context of your career right what you would do and all of that the horizontal line that you have in the pie the horizontal line it signifies broad basic skills and then you have two vertical lines which are deep lines supposed to be one of them is for technology depth and the second sir, one is for the domain expertise sir some of the slides sir some of the slides are not changing which slide do you have right now you are still in the first slide okay sorry If we exit full screen, yeah, now it is fine. Yes, you are in this cartoon now. Yes. Okay. So anyway, that's fine. The cartoon is 
not that relevant but so as i mentioned the pi architecture is like the letter pi which has one horizontal line and two vertical lines so the horizontal line signifies basic broad skills that every student must have for you know across various disciplines then you are expected to pick one technology depth and then one domain expertise and if you put a balance around this that should be a good uh, architecture for how you should plan your career so clearly since we are talking about data science one of the technology domain or the depth for this group of audience is clearly the data science skills so what i'm going to talk about today is that i have a 10 point idea so 10 ideas on what you should be focusing on the first three are around the horizontal or basic skills the next three four five six are regarding the data science skills and then seven eight nine are more the domain or the context skills and then finally i want to set a context for how you should plan your career as number 10 Now I didn't uh, understand that. Yes, this one second these things. So in the basic skills that you need to have, clearly you need programming skills such as Python and Julia. These are the two most popular environments that people use for uh doing machine learning and AI programming. In addition to the programming skills, you should also gather statistics and data analysis skills. Here the most common tools are R and Excel. and uh, when you talk about excel actually excel is a very handy tool and very valuable tool as well and it's most popular everywhere in the industry and in all the organizations now excel has some very interesting features including programming capabilities and macros and a whole bunch of other things and you have lambda functions as well so there are a lot of very interesting capabilities in excel that you should learn and how you should know how to manage in addition to the basic coding skills you should have good software engineering hygiene how to check in code how to look at code and various other basic stuff as to how do you compile how do you run code how do you manage code and things like that in addition to that github is again a very useful thing to know github also has repositories of various interesting code that you might find that you might you find it useful to learn so getting to know how to use and look at github is github is very important then you need to know scripting and prototyping and rapid prototyping and i'll come back to some of this in a later point uh two other skills that are necessary are of course collaboration skills and communication skills and i don't want to spend too much time on these right now but when i come to the second half of this presentation i will show you why this these are very important skills okay in addition to these basic skills like programming and other things basic computer science skills are also very useful for people who want to build a career in data science so they must have good understanding of data structures and algorithms and must understand how to represent things because you know when you are trying to formulate a problem and to create a solution for someone the representation of how you describe your problem and how you set it up is very important to understand and follow up on the uh, on how you might implement the data science solutions then uh, today's world people are looking at very large amounts of data and data is distributed all over the place and you have to understand how distributed architectures work and there are a set of things around this which you should be aware of and i'm sure they are teaching you some of these in your college and your university as well uh, of course every programming today is happening in the cloud environment so you should understand how to write code that runs in one of the cloud environments either the amazon the google or on uh, microsoft azure but you must be writing code that runs on the on the cloud finally the most important thing in the context of uh, computer science is to understand trade offs so when we write algorithms it's kind of important to understand that what kind of trade offs do we have and when you choose a certain algorithm what are the benefits you get but also what trade offs have you do you have to deal with so are you going to consume too much space is the algorithm slow is it more accurate but not that uh, you know it doesn't consume space time complexity so all of these things are very important because computer science the main theme about what we learn in computer science is the ability and art of making trade offs so there may be many solutions to the same problem but we need to understand the context in which we are going to apply that solution so that we can pick the right trade offs for the particular problem okay beyond these skills because and it was already mentioned by professor saha as well that uh, uh, data science has to do with data and uh, one of the important things with data is to the ability to manipulate data 
And when you look at data manipulation, you need to understand the basic database skills, such as relational databases, and you can pick on some of these open source ones. Every data scientist must understand SQL and be able to program effectively using SQL. But beyond the SQL and the relational systems, today many systems are being built on, the, on top of either the document DB, key value pairs, columnar stores, or graph DB. And these understanding of exactly how they work and in which context would you use which particular kind of database is very important to understand. And then uh, we are all using many big data tools. So today, one of the most popular big data environments is the one that comes from Databricks. And Databricks' environment is coming out of Spark. So if you look at the Spark Apache.org, they have the original Spark stuff, but Databricks is a very nice implementation of Spark. And Spark plus machine learning are starting to become extremely popular. In addition to that, you must understand how to manipulate data. So you must look at things like uh, ETL tools and then uh, you know data manipulation tools like pandas or numpy or any of these kinds of uh, uh, tools that are very important for uh, operating in this uh, data science world. So these were the three basic things that I wanted to mention. These are the horizontal line of the pie. Now, when it comes to the vertical line, there are a set of algorithms that are fairly well known when it comes to machine learning. So machine learning has a, you know, today's environments, if you go to any machine learning environment, you will be able to choose what kind of algorithms you can use depending on the problem you are trying to solve. So if you are trying to do classification, then you may want to use supervised learning. Or if you're trying to do clustering, you may want to use unsupervised learning. So there are many different algorithms that have been written or are well understood. One of the big jobs that data scientists have is to understand which particular algorithm makes sense for which context. So this is a big part of what is expected out of a data science scientist. There's also a lot of work that has happened in the last few years around deep learning and uh, understanding of how deep learning works and how you can build systems using deep learning and neural networks is again another important thing that data scientists must know and figure out how to go about doing it. Um, I just have a list of some of the tools that uh, I asked internally at Persistent saying that, hey, when you are looking for fresh graduates or you're looking for people who are going to join you, what kind of tools do you expect them to learn? So this is a small list of things that uh, we find that a lot of people who are doing data science today come uh, have a good understanding of Jupyter. Uh, there's a pretty nice uh, platform called Collab on Google research, the DVC, MLflow, Streamlet, Polit, you know, Plotly, PyTorch, TensorFlow. And for your benefit, I have left you with some URLs. And this presentation I have already shared with Professor Matthew. And if you need it, you can get it or you can send me a mail and I'll be happy to forward this to you. So at least it will give you some links of where you should go in terms of looking at some of these things. The other interesting thing that uh, I have been quite fascinated about for the last one and a half to two years is the GPT-3 uh, system that is now available. For the last few months now, they have made a beta set available for anybody. And you know, there is no waiting list and you can sign up and start using it and start playing out with some of these examples. So I said, okay, since I'm gonna do this talk for you all, I thought, let me also check how GPT-3 works for you. And I sort of got it on and kind of picked one of those examples that is already there in factual answering. So it's a question answer system. So you can put a question and the system gives you the answer. So then I asked the GPT-3 system saying, hey, what should I do to become a data scientist? So the GPT these answers that I have have come directly from the system says that learn Python, R, SQL, and machine learning. And I asked them, okay, 10 things I should master to be a data scientist. So they gave me this list, Python, R, SQL, machine learning, Hadoop, Spark, Tableau, HBase, Cassandra, MongoDB, and things like that. Then again, I asked them, okay, which algorithm should I learn to be a data scientist? So I got these nine that came in. And last one was CLUST. So I said, okay, what is CLUST really? So then GPT-3 gave me an explanation of how this works. So GPT-3 has become a very interesting uh, environment for you to try out uh, you know, how to work this out and how to play around with this kind of system. And some of these things, because GPT-3 has such a large number of documents that they have, so, so to say, learned, uh, this deep learning algorithm is quite valuable and 
And if you, it's quite fascinating and surprisingly uh, powerful in terms of what they are able to do using this platform. Uh, today, again, if you go to most of these hyperscaler cloud environments, you will find that each of them have their own AI studios. So Google has something they call AutoML, Amazon has the SageMaker, and Azure has the machine learning studio. Again, it's pretty easy to get on them. You can get on a beta site very quickly. Uh, you can get a demo user license, and you can play around with this online without having to install anything on your system. So a lot of these facilities are very easily available. And I highly encourage some of you to try these out so that you know at least one of this you should become a you should be very proficient in so that you can start to play around and start to become uh, build out samples, models, various other things of that kind. Now the last thing I want to mention in terms of things that are very AI specific are the need to build AI models and to build special that requires special skills. See, essentially when you do machine learning, machine learning depends on the quality of the model that you build. So model building is an iterative process and you have to build something, try it out, see how it works, experiment, and then either say, okay, if it's making sense, then you kind of extend it and you do this one step at a, at a time. And if it finds that it's not working out, then you pivot and you let it go. So you basically have to build this build, measure, learn, do. So you have to build the experiment, measure the results, learn whether it has worked or not worked, and then go back to building the next round of the experiment. So this kind of model building requires a lot of skill. And it is always good to have people who understand this and work with them so that you can learn how to be a good modeler. The quality of your machine learning results depend a lot on the model that you use for solving these kinds of problems. Now, when you look at machine learning, you are very interested in using machine learning in real world context. So if you are interested in working in say medical domain, you may be interested in, in using machine learning for interpreting radiology data or for blood samples or for various other kinds of things. So clearly a lot of times machine learning gets applied in real world situations. And in that context, you have to work with people who have good understanding of the domain. Now you're going to graduate from IIT Patna with a degree in computer science. You're doing a lot of things, but you may not be expected to know everything in other domains. So you really need to understand how to collaborate with experts from other domain who have the domain knowledge and understanding of their field. And how can you come in and work with them to build the models and to understand how to build solutions where you can work together to build the solution together. So this is sort of why I was trying to point out the importance of communication and collaboration skills, because unless you are able to collaborate with experts who have domain knowledge, you will not be able to model their knowledge in the systems that you want to build for machine learning. So clearly this is critical. The number eight point on this that I want to make is the importance of problem formulation. So, you know, a lot of times when you ask the right question, you'll get the right answer, but it is not that easy to figure out what is the right question to ask. And a lot of times I meet a lot, many of my colleagues and others where they start working on the problem without thinking about what is the real question that you are trying to solve? What problem are you really trying to solve? Because unless you take that into account, you will be all over the place. So it is kind of important to think a little bit about what is the problem you are going to solve? What are the answers? What kind of answers are you expecting from the system? Are the solutions or the results that you're going to get from the system relevant for what you want to do? And how do you put this all together? So that's an important aspect of what I'd like you to think about. And then finally, you know, uh, data science has multiple things. As I mentioned, you have to get the problem statement. You need to know how to process the data. You have to do modeling. You have to have algorithms. And you need an eventual goal of where you're trying to go. Now, when you're going through this pipeline, there are many issues that could creep up. One of the very difficult to fix kind of issues is relating to bias. So today, when we say that we are going to do systems that are based on existing data that you have, today our data may be biased. So if we already have some bias in our data, bias meaning preconceived assumption about uh, the context in which this data is built out, then you might end up creating systems that will only enhance and further this bias, which is really not a good thing for any, any specific context. So you know it's kind of very important for people who are kind of do, doing this kind of machine learning and data science work to understand the importance of bias. They should understand ethical issues and security issues. So 
So for example, you know, you, if you build an autonomous car uh, and you find a situation where uh, you might hit one person and he might die, but if you don't hit him, you might go hit another 10 people. So which one should you pick? So there are a lot of different kinds of issues that come up where ethical issues are very important and you must understand what is the what are the consequences of some of the systems that you're building. And then of course, security, I should not say, you know, there's, in, there's, these are all huge problems. So once you start to depend on these systems, if there are flaws in it, or if there are errors in it, then you are creating a system where you are completely dependent on them. But the reality is that um, they are now, you know, not necessarily accurate or whatever else. So they're not giving the right results. So that could be very dangerous. And the last thing now I want to share is the overall context. And this is a chart that I use for a lot of people that I mentor. And the idea is that you guys who are graduating, maybe you are at the early, in your early 20s, but you're going to work for at least 20 to at least 40 to 50 years as your career. And when you look at your career, you have to plan your career in my opinion in these 10 year stages. So in the first stage, you should focus on learning and networking. In the second stage, you should establish an identity. By that, I mean that by the time you, you are 20 years in your career, you should be able to say that I'm an expert at something. And what is that expertise that has, you have gained because of your 20 years of experience? And then in the last two stages, and I'll not spend too much time on it, is to the pursuit of the corner office and the final run and setting up for retirement. But uh, let me focus on the first one. And my point here is that all of you who are graduating from IIT Patna now must learn two very important skills in addition to what is being taught in college. One is to learn to learn, and the second one is learn to network. Because if you learn these things early on, then this will take you handy and be very useful for you in the rest of your career. If you miss out doing this in your early days, it is very hard to go back and learn how to learn and learn how to network. So this is why I think this is a very important discipline. And when we are looking at uh, stuff in the context of data science, this is even more important because uh, in the data science, the situation is that we get uh, things change very quickly. Systems are built very fast. Um, new things come, keep coming up. So you have to keep yourselves completely updated. And uh, one of the good sources for like, looking at what's happening is to look at various blogs and also to listen to various podcasts. So I've shared some of the essential blogs that some of our team members who work in data science read and all of, all of that stuff. And just like a well-tuned athlete who needs to exercise every day, uh, it is important that any data scientist should keep abreast with what's happening in the field and must spend time reading up on some of these ideas on an ongoing basis. So last thing I wanna mention is that clearly we are you are all in a demanding profession, but that's the reason why you are in demand. So that's uh, really where I want to end this. And I just want to leave this thought with you that if you're looking for jobs in data science, clearly we are also hiring at Persistent, but so is everybody else. So right now this is a very good market to be in the market for looking for jobs. But if you are going to be in the market looking for jobs, having good skills will only help you be more effective than you would if you are not very well skilled. And this is something that I tell everyone that I really believe that people like you who are very privileged, who have come to IIT, should not really be focusing on jobs, but should become job creators. So don't be job suckers, become job creators. So that's sort of where I'm going to end this session. And if we have an opportunity to take any questions, I'd be happy to take that. But if that doesn't work out, please do not hesitate to write to me at anand.persistent.com. And I will try my best to give you an answer to your question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, does anyone have any questions from the audience? Yeah, ma'am, may I ask? I'm Rishi here. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Anand, sir. That was uh, great research that you did on the technologies and the issues that we face in the data science market. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask, uh, as the founder of your company, what is the percentage of time you recommend your employees uh, employees to invest in learning new things? Like we have 24 hours and they have to do their regular work also, the client work. So how much percentage of time you want your employees to invest? No, I think, uh, let me sort of separate this out. So I think every professional needs to spend about 15 to 
of their time learning new things on an ongoing basis. And uh, when we work with our clients or customers, typically the clients are okay about us spending time to sharpen the saw, as we call it, while we are still on the project. So yeah, many there, most people will get that kind of an opportunity, but the field that we are working in is so demanding and it keeps changing all the time that you, know, you should be planning on investing about 15 to 20% of your time in sharpening your skills on an ongoing basis. Thank you, sir. That answers the question. Any other questions? Okay, I think uh, we can of course take these questions offline. So yes, yes, sir. To write to me. Uh, I just want to wish the conference all the very best. I think we have some excellent speakers lined up for the for this session, and uh, I would like to encourage all of you to use this opportunity to learn as much as you can about new developments in data science and machine learning. So thank you very much for attending this session, and also thank you for participating in this conference. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Matthew and Sri Parna. And I'm going to hand it back to you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for your motivating words. Uh, I request Dr. Jimson Matthew to kindly present a memento to Dr. Deshpande. So uh, can I, am I audible and uh, screen is shared, I guess? Yes, sir. You're audible. So, yes. yes. So uh, since it's a virtual event, we have to do this <laughs> moment also virtually. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Tien Singh, our director, uh, for making the presidential address. And <laughs> And I also like to thank uh, our chairman uh, for spending his time with us and detailed uh, keynote. Thing. Thank you. Back, back to uh, Sakamitra. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so to conclude the event, I would like to request Dr. Samrat Mandal, Assistant Professor of Department of Computer Science, IIT Patna, and Organizing Committee member of ICDSE 2021 to kindly give away the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Sangamitra. I hope uh, my voice is audible. Yes, sir. Okay. A very good afternoon, uh, Honorable BOG Chairman, IIT Patna, Dr. Anand Pandey, Honorable Director, IT partner, Professor Tian Singh, uh, CSE department head, Dr. Sripanna Shah, program chair, Dr. Jameson Mathu, other organizing members, uh, volunteers, and their participants. A conference such as this always provides an opportunity for the budding researchers to interact with the various other researchers working in uh, similar domains. I personally have experienced one uh, fruitful collaboration which was initiated from a, uh, from a conference venue such as uh, this type of uh, venue. Although it is happening in online mode, uh, but I hope this seventh edition of International Conference on Data Science and Engineering or ICDC will also provide similar opportunities for all the participants. So IT Partner is committed to not only in teaching and research, but also organizing other events like this to promote various research activities. And we are pleased to see a very good uh, participation. And uh, Dr. Jimson Matthew has already uh, given an overview of the event so far. So uh, let me come to my uh, 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 responsibility. First and foremost, I would like to thank the Honorable Chairman, BOG IT partner, Dr. Anandesh Pandey, sir, for the inaugural keynote talk on how do I become a better scientist and 10 things I must do to be a better data scientist. Now, data scientists are, are really in high demand in today's uh, digital age. And in this context, you 
have highlighted some important factors that would really motivate many young and experienced engineers who would like to contribute seriously uh, to data science. And uh, in this context, you have presented the different data scientist skills using uh, the Pi architecture, which was itself is a very uh, nice uh, way to explain the various skills. And also you have uh, presented various AI tools and frameworks, and I hope uh, as your slides are available, uh, many participants will get benefited from uh, those uh, links. And uh, many other things that you have suggested that uh, for learning how to learn and learning how to network. So all those suggestions uh, will uh, uh, try to adapt. Uh, not only the participants, uh, we will also try to adapt. Uh, so on behalf of the ICDC organizing team, we would like to thank you for spending your valuable time uh, with us and also for this insp inspiring talk. I would also like to thank Honorable Director for this inaugural talk of ICDC. In spite of his busy schedule, Director Sir has agreed to uh, for this uh, presidential address. And on behalf of the team, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to our Director Sir for his valuable time. Uh, uh, I would also like to thank Dr. Siparna Shah, head CAC department for providing the glimpses of the uh, department and also the importance of uh, data science. Thank you, Dr. Sipana, for your presence and all the support you have provided for the conference. Um, also, I would like to thank Dr. Jimson Mathu, the program chair of, for that welcome talk and for taking the major load for meticulously organizing this event. Without his initiative, this conference would not have been possible. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Arijit, for introducing our keynote speaker. And thanks to all the authors who have contributed their research ideas for this event. The authors uh, will be presenting their ideas in the upcoming technical sessions. And also um, there will be a few other keynote talks. And I'm sure um, all this will be very uh, beneficial for uh, your respective uh, research, um, uh, research uh, area. Last but not the least, I'd like to thank all the conference organizing members and the student volunteers who have helped in various ways in managing and organizing this event. And uh, yeah, special thanks to Sangamitra who agreed to be anchor for this event at the last end. Finally, I thank you all for your participation for this session. Thank you again, Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So uh, now I'd like to hand over the forum to Dr. Jimson Matthew to continue with the events. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Sankamitra. And uh, formally, we close the inaugural uh, session now, and we are just on time for the next uh, keynote speaker from Professor Hans from Kunis University. Uh, Deepak? Yeah, can you hear me well? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, th thanks for uh, just a second. Let me just make sure that, yeah. Okay, uh, so it's my pleasure uh, to, uh, to be able to introduce um, Hans, who is my, my collaborator and colleague. Uh, so Hans Van Dierendonk is a professor in high performance and data intensive computing in the School of Electronics, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Queen's University in Belfast. He's a director, he's a director of the Center of Data Science and Scalable Computing in the Institute of Electronics, Communications and Information Technology. His research interests are in high performance data analytics with particular interest on in graph processing and transprecise computing. Hans also has a vested interest in computer architecture and particularly in cache architecture, prediction and performance evaluation. He's a senior member of the ACM and IEEE. And today his talk will be on resource efficient machine learning. And so over to you, Hans, uh, if, you, if you would like to share a screen, I hope you can do that. Hans. Yes. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Very well. Very well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for uh, inviting me here for this presentation. Um, I am uh, going to see how to share the screen here. Um, sorry about that. Um, so, is that um, visible? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Good. Uh, 
Thank you uh, again for uh, inviting me here. So today I would like to um, uh, present some work we have been doing on methodologies and tools for resource constrained uh, machine learning. Um, so this work has been performed in the, in the context of the Center for Data Science and Scalable Computing. Um, so just very quickly uh, introducing the center. So we have um, a group of people working together on various areas uh, of machine learning and data science, um, and uh, on, on the one hand, and also on uh, systems implementations, edge and cloud computing, high performance computing, and so on, on the other hand. Um, and so uh, Deepak, as he mentioned, is uh, also a member of this center. So um, what I want to talk about today is uh, resource efficiency in, in machine learning. And so the uh, main motivation for looking into this is that AI, uh, so artificial intelligence and machine learning applications are increasingly used in a variety of settings. We're also looking at deploying them in uh, various uh, computing environments, such as cloud computing, but also uh, in autonomous settings, uh, end user devices, uh, there's uh, Internet of Things with um, intelligence embedded in, in a variety of small devices. And so these uh, devices are often uh, resource constrained, which means they can do limited amounts of computations, they have limited amounts of memory, and their battery lifetimes are often a, con a constraint. Um, and so that means that if we look at machine learning, that's very often we have complicated algorithms that we want to uh, execute within a uh, constrained resource. Um, and so the uh, goal of resource efficient machine learning is to achieve high accurate machine learning at low computation energy budgets. Uh, there exist many experimental approaches in this area. Uh, what the research we have been doing uh, tries to do is to develop robust methodologies um, that allows us to, to design uh, these systems more efficiently. And so throughout this presentation, um, I want to highlight three of those approaches that we have been investigating over recent years. Um, so the first approach is, is based on numerical analysis, which is derived effectively from uh, the scientific computing community. And the second approach, we will be looking at uh, custom number formats, which are increasingly used in, in deep learning. Um, and then um, finally, we'll also have um, a look at how we can select appropriate neural networks uh, to trade off um, uh, the complexity of the network against um, the execution time. Um, so first of all, um, a few uh, definitions. Unfortunately, we have to be uh, uh, bringing a bit of uh, terminology in here. So the terms accuracy and precision are frequently used in data science and have their very specific meanings. When we look at the system implementation, we use different definitions for these terms. So I think it's useful to, to establish what we mean uh, by them throughout this presentation. So with accuracy, we mean the absolute relative error of an approximate quantity. Um, so if we make a prediction or classification, that's um, an approximate quantity that has been computed. And uh, this may or may not be um, accurate. And so the deviation of the known correct uh, response that we should have been having is, is um, termed here the accuracy. With precision, we mean the accuracy with which we can perform basic arithmetic operations, such as addition, subtractions, multiplication, and divisions. Um, so the precision um, very often, um, uh, well, we know it relates to the uh, precision by which um, floating point numbers can be represented because a lot of the computations here are based on floating point numbers. And so uh, within the IEEE standards, we have um, standardized single precision formats and double precision formats. Uh, each of those formats has a certain precision, a certain number of, uh, well, a certain amount of error that may creep in every time we perform one of the basic arithmetic uh, operations. These are known as a machine epsilon, and they essentially relate to uh, the number of bits that we have within the mantis or significant uh, of these uh, number formats. So basically the important thing here is that we know that for each uh, number format that we may use, there's a certain error that can uh, appear and we can tune that error um, depend well, by choosing the appropriate number format. 
so then if we perform a uh, algorithm, basically any algorithm, so even uh, this applies also to machine learning uh, or, or data uh, analytics, um, then we are performing some computation typically on floating point numbers. And whenever we perform such computations, there are errors that happen which are um, key to um, how the number formats are uh, designed. And um, within uh, numerical analysis uh, or numerical linear algebra, there is a technique known as backward error analysis, which allows us to break down um, those errors in different components. Uh, I, I won't be going into the full detail of these techniques, um, but what is um, essential here is that we can model a computation um, indicated here by the uh, rectangular box, which is a vector, uh, sorry, a matrix vector product. So we can model that as if the computation is uh, occurring at a full uh, precision, so with real um, mathematically abstract numbers, uh, which have you know, an infinite number of digits potentially. And so we can model that uh, the uh, finite precision computation on a real computing system as such a full precision arithmetic whereby there's a deviation on the input. So the matrix and the vector have some deviation which um, um, then translates into a deviation on the output. Uh, so the modeling techniques allow us to do that and split out the error in two components. Um, so the error, so the deviation of our computation on a computing system uh, deviates from what is the mathematically correct computation in two components. One is an unavoidable error, which uh, is a propagation of the deviations that we modeled on the input. And the other is a component which is due to um, uh, rounding errors and which are a consequence of limited arithmetic precision in the number formats and the arithmetic. And so basically what this allows us to do is to say that while well, there's an unavoidable error, uh, which has a certain size, which relates also to the computation being performed, and there's a rounding error. And if the rounding error is smaller than the unavoidable and then the unavoidable error, we can actually make a good computation. And we might use bigger and uh, more precise number formats to reduce the rounding error. But at some point, uh, this will become negligible comparable to the unavoidable error. So basically, we can use that as a guideline as to how much precision we really need to be in a, uh, in a good position to make a meaningful computation. If our number formats are too narrow and have not enough precision, then we will uh, um, end up with a potentially high error, but if we can keep it small enough, we can basically uh, balance the rounding error to be just below the unavoidable error uh, for a good trade-off between precision uh, in the number format and the accuracy of the computation. So we've applied that to uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, in particular, we have been uh, looking at the kernel recursive least squares uh, algorithm um, as, as one example as to how we can uh, apply this. And the block diagram here on the right represents the flow of computation. Uh, I won't be going into the detail of this, but essentially it falls apart in two components. There's a, an orange part, um, which is um, based on our analysis numerically uh, unstable. Um, so that means you need a high uh, precision in the arithmetic to perform this accurately. And then the green part of the computation is um, um, a, a component of the computation which is um, numerically stable and can be performed at lower uh, accuracy, sorry, lower precision. Uh, the green part also turns out to be the most com uh, time consuming part, which means we can save uh, potentially um, a, a, a high amount of computation time by reducing uh, the precision and the number format. So intuitively, this result follows from how uh, kernel recursive least squares methods work. So essentially we are, um, it's a streaming algorithm where we have as input um, vectors of uh, data, so data points, multidimensional data points. And the algorithm tries to learn a set of basis vectors within a certain uh, space that represents accurately the types of inputs that we might see. Um, and the orange part of the computation is essentially uh, observing that there's a new vector that we need to learn. So to increase the dimensionality of the support vector space. Um, and so that's um, an, a 
um, an infrequent computation because usually, um, well, if we've learned the, the sequence of um, inputs, then we don't need to change the, the support vector space frequently. And so that means it's, it's infrequent, but also when we try to learn uh, or try to adapt the computation, we will have to look at the difference between two vectors in the input or in the support vector space. And uh, those uh, differences can be become very small. Um, and that then leads to uh, numerical instability because we also have to um, do inversions of uh, these matrices. Um, so, and then you can get into interesting results, which are a bit more detailed, such as the one of the hyperparameters, which is called new within the algorithm. As it gets smaller, you need uh, bigger uh, or more precise uh, arithmetic, so bigger number of presentations. So you can link the hyperparameters to the um, precision of the arithmetic that is required. So if we apply that um, to algorithms, then we can see, for instance, for the sunspot time series, which is um, a time series that represents um, um, black spots on the sun and how they move about. Uh, it's a very chaotic series. Um, then we can see if we run the uh, KRLS algorithm at single uh, precision, so IEEE 32-bit uh, floating point numbers, then it uh, does not give any meaningful result uh, because of the instability of the algorithm. Uh, if you run it at double precision, uh, we get meaningful answers. But if we run it at our, the mixed precision algorithm that we designed uh, as presented in the previous slide, then we can get the same accuracy. And because the frequent path then uses single position floating point numbers, that means um, we can run it faster. Uh, so the computations take less time and also the storage of the, um, of the matrices that we need to store within the um, algorithm uh, are more compact because of the reduced precision. Um, and so this is um, something we are exploring further. So we are also looking at uh, other algorithms to um, um, identify how we can um, analyze their, um, their precision needs. Uh, so we've also done this, for instance, for general uh, linear regression problems. <clears throat> so that then brings me to the uh, second um, um, point. So we have so far been uh, considering two uh, precisions. So there's single precision, there's double precision, uh, but is that all we need? Uh, it's, it's just two uh, number formats. And so if we look at the evolution, in the recent evolution, then there has been a lot of interest in 16-bit um, floating point numbers, uh, specifically uh, for the purpose of deep learning. Uh, so deep learning is very data intensive, compacting the representation of the networks by using 16-bit numbers rather than 32-bit numbers um, is uh, very beneficial for increasing performance. Uh, but then you, if you look at what different uh, uh, organizations are doing within the space and you see that they use different or propose different number formats, even within a 16-bit floating point uh, number format. And essentially, the difference between the formats that are being proposed, they differ in how the allocation of bits uh, differs between the exponent and the mantissa. And then... Um, well, the question then becomes, well, what is the right number format to use? And um, you know, why should you have five-bit exponents or why should you have six-bit exponents and so on? And so then um, essentially then what um, our conclusion is on the basis of this is that on the one hand, we need ways to identify what is a good number format for a particular algorithm or a particular data set. Um, and then obviously you, we also need to have means to uh, use those number formats. So our proposition is that we should increasingly think about application specific number formats that are defined in software. So today, all of our number formats are implemented in hardware. The uh, processor has to support 32-bit uh, floating point arithmetic or it has to support 64-bit floating point arithmetic. If it doesn't do that, then um, the alternative of software emulation of those uh, number formats is very inefficient. Um, so we are highly reliant on the hardware implementing these number formats. But in order to have application-specific number formats, what we really need is to rethink that hardware and design generic functions 
that apply to a variety of arithmetic formats and allow us to uh, implement those. Uh, that's not uh, the purpose of this talk. Um, and it's also not something that we are pursuing, but we're saying that this is what we should have. Uh, a related question is then what are suitable arithmetic formats? Um, and so we'll uh, talk a little bit about that. And then we need to have efficient conversions between our narrow custom formats and standardized IEEE float and double formats because that's what the hardware implements. So in the absence of better suited uh, hardware primitives, uh, we need to map our formats onto what the hardware supports. Um, so we've been exploring this. And so one example algorithm we've been looking at is the page rank algorithm. Um, I'm not going to go into details of the algorithm. So it's basically a power iteration method to identify uh, eigenvalue, uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, basically the, the primary eigenvector. Um, when you analyze this algorithm, you can come to the conclusion that every page rank value essentially is bounded within a certain range. Um, and so that range is displayed here on the right hand side of the slide. And it effectively tells us that the page rank value is less than one. Uh, and the lowest possible page rank value you can have is one minus d over n, where d is a parameter in the algorithm. And n is the number of vertices in the graph uh, or the dimensionality of the adjacency matrix. Um, and then you can make uh, observations as to um, how many um, um, mantissa bits one would need um, to converge to a certain uh, threshold. Um, so based on this information, then we can design a number of formats. So again, I'm not going to go through the detail here, but essentially um, the um, important observation is that because there's a bounded range of values, um, we can make observation that there's certain bits within any floating point number that represents a page rank value that are fixed. In particular, the high end bits of the exponent, uh, one can demonstrate that they have a specific pattern, which basically means you don't need to store that because you know in advance what that bit pattern is. And for the mantissa, it's very well known that more mantissa bits give you higher precision, uh, and that's something that you can tune. And actually within a page rank algorithm, it's, it's an established knowledge that you can um, vary the number of bits throughout the algorithm. So you start with very few mantissa bits and then they start to become stable after several iterations of the, of the algorithm. And so you get more and more mantissa bits being stable. So you can actually grow the number of mantissa bits throughout the algorithm. Um, so these things are known, uh, but then the contribution that we have made is to um, design a number format, which is very compact. Uh, so we have proposed a 16 bit uh, number format where we do not store a sign bit because we don't need it. And then we use uh, six exponent bits and 10 mantissa bits. And um, so on the right-hand side, you can choose the uh, residual error of the algorithm. So essentially you need to run the page rank algorithm or the power iteration algorithm until the residual error uh, drops below a certain threshold, uh, which is application dependent. So uh, for some applications, uh, you might want a uh, more stringent threshold than for others. Um, and then, so um, what follows is that for different um, um, number formats, you can reach different um, 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 thresholds for those uh, residual errors. So there's a technique known as CPMS, um, which is coming out of academia. Um, which basically stores the, six, the, the top 16 bits of a double precision floating point number with the arguments that it's easy to convert to a full 64 bit number. Uh, our proposed 16 bit format uh, can reach um, um, almost two orders of magnitude better um, um, errors. So it's, it's uh, more accurate and it's almost as accurate as, um, well, it's less than an order of magnitude worse than single precision floating point numbers, which actually do not lead to convergence for large graphs. Um, and so um, if, if we analyze algorithms, basically the conclusion is that we can identify good number formats that are very specific to the algorithm. 
and that um, are efficient to convert back and forth. The, um, um, well, so here's a slide then showing what performance benefits that would give. So compared to a uh, full dollar precision algorithm, which is required for um, convergence, um, one would be able to get uh, around um, uh, roughly 20 to 40% speed up for the majority of data sets that one would want to do this on. And for, in some cases it's more or less. Um, <clears throat> So we are exploring how to design such custom number formats also for different algorithms. So for instance, we are working on the belief propagation algorithm, uh, which is also very sensitive to uh, the precision. The third uh, component I wanted to talk about is the um, looking at neural networks. Um, so, um, and in particular, we're looking here at uh, video analytics. So um, the problem here is to do object detection. And within object detection, uh, typically neural networks are now used to identify those objects. So essentially, uh, in very simplistic terms, we uh, look at one frame in the video. Um, the neural network anal analyzes it and identifies, um, in this case, we're interested in uh, people. So for each person that it recognizes within um, the, the frame of the video, it identifies one bounding box of that person. Um, now, the challenge here is that evaluating so these deep neural networks at frame rate uh, may be impossible, especially if you want to run the deep neural networks on low end devices or edge and IoT devices. Uh, there is an argument to do this, uh, to analyze the, the video stream on the device itself using uh, resource constrained hardware because transmitting all of this data to the cloud is uh, energy consuming and also very bandwidth intensive. Um, so when we cannot um, evaluate um, the uh, video at frame rate, the consequence then is that we need to drop frames uh, to compensate for the long inference latency. So there is a trade-off here between the network that we choose and how complex the task is that it needs to do. And so it's known, well, there are different networks um, available, uh, different architectures, different organizations and, and dimensions of the network architectures. And so there's a question as to, should we choose uh, one network or another? And then it turns out that which network gives good performance actually correlates with the content of the video. So here in this plot on the horizontal axis, we've shown four different networks. So these are all YOLO uh, version four networks. Um, so there's two tiny networks and two full networks. The different bars correspond to two different videos from the MO2E17 challenge. And so if you try to run these uh, at frame rate um, on a uh, NVIDIA Jetson nano board, then we observe that for the um, um, MO2E1704 video stream, which is represented by the blue bars, then the, the biggest network gives us the best accuracy for the average precision according to the MOT challenge metric. And um, the MOT1711 uh, video stream gets the best accuracy by using uh, a tiny 416 uh, Euro V4 network. So there's a trade-off and that trade-off actually can be seen from uh, the content of the video. So if you have a video with uh, very few, very large objects, then a, a tiny network with limited resolution can actually recognize those objects accurately while if you have many small objects, then you need a network with a, with a higher resolution and, and, and more complexity. Um, <clears throat> so then what we set out to do is that we designed a, a system to uh, try to infer what network it should be running on uh, on the next frame based on the content of the previous frame. So within the video stream, we can assume that subsequent frame, frames have a lot of similarity uh, because you're taking pictures, subsequent pictures of the real world, typically only uh, tens or hundreds of milliseconds apart. 
So the, the difference you can observe is not very large. And so one frame can predict well what the content of the next frame will be. So we look at the detections of bounding boxes that are being made using a particular neural network. Um, so one of these four neural networks that we've been looking at. And then we try to use that to predict what should be, um, what network should be used for the next frames. Important here is that we do not uh, assume um, online feedback. Um, so, um, um, sorry. So we do not assume online um, correctness information here, whether um, the information we, or whether the bounding boxes we detect are correct or not. We're just assuming that uh, the majority of those bounding boxes uh, will be uh, correct predictions. Um, and so we designed the mechanism, which is fairly simple. It looks at the median of the bounding boxes being detected and uh, then uh, uses uh, hyperparameter search to determine what are good uh, separation points for the bounding box sizes uh, to determine which of the networks to use. And that's a very, very simple technique. And if you look at the uh, accuracy or the average precision that we um, obtain uh, from this, then we can see that for a number of uh, video streams, then um, this dynamic choice of the network um, actually is as good or almost as good as the best uh, network we could have chosen throughout the video. The important thing here is that additionally, we vary that uh, choice of network dynamically from frame to frame. So at some points during the video, we might be using one uh, network and a lot of points of the video, we will be using a different one. And so that's uh, shown here. So for the different networks, uh, it shows um, what proportion of the frames um, are predicted using the different networks. And we see that different video streams use different networks or they result in the use of different networks, uh, depending on the content of the video. Now on the right hand side, it shows the variation over time. So over frame sequence numbers, uh, which network have we chosen to use and how much um, 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 energy is consumed uh, or power is consumed while doing so. So the orange line uh, represents the uh, power consumed by the Euro V4416 network, which is the biggest and most complex that we looked at. Um, and then the blue line shows over time how much uh, power we are drawing on this uh, NVIDIA nano board. And so the power draw varies over time, depending on which network we uh, desire to use um, um, during the execution. Um, so then brings us to the conclusion of this talk. Um, so, Within um, data science algorithms, so whether it's you call it artificial intelligence, machine learning, or, or analytics, um, the workloads naturally um, allow trading precision against system metrics. Um, so, in system metrics, including execution time, energy consumption, and memory footprint. And so, that means with a, a good choice of the algorithms and a good uh, tuning of the algorithms, we can actually. Um, achieve the same results with fewer resources. Um, the aim of the work is to uh, create new opportunities for deployment without negatively affecting accuracy, which means um, it becomes then possible to apply uh, all of these algorithms in a variety of settings where you would currently struggle to do that due to resource constraints. Um, the important thing from scientific perspective is that we need methods, techniques, and tools to enable this and to um, um, make this process as painless as possible. Uh, the reality is that we very often end up with bespoke solutions for very specific algorithms. And so generalizing all of this work is, is the roadmap and an open challenge. So that ends the uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hans. Uh... So do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, no, yes, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir, for the nice presentation. So I have a small uh, question regarding this uh, trans object detection. 
so uh, if we see practically what will happen is uh, we have to maintain both the networks the small network and the big network so if we want to apply it uh, let us say in some kind of iot system so uh, the requirement for the hardware will be uh, uh, 